Jesus, they say well, on Calle Ocho. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Judge, my name is Paul Lipton, and I am a member of the Florida Bar, and I'm interviewing the different representatives of the Florida Bar that the Historic Video Society and the uh, Center on Professionalism mm -hmm. believes need to be interviewed so that young lawyers and law students can get a sense of our history and uh, your thoughts as an elder states person of the Florida Bar as to what's um, gone before and what your hopes are for the future for the Florida Bar. So with that, let me first ask you if you could give to us a little oral history of um, your personal history. Uh, where'd you come from? When I came to Miami, Florida, from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was born in Washington, D.C., but my father was from Chattanooga. He and my mother were married in Washington, and they returned to Chattanooga where he was a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, I was, I was, my mother went home to Washington, D.C., where I was born, and then she came back to Chattanooga, and I lived there until 1921 when we moved to Miami, Florida. How old were you when you moved to Miami, Florida? Well, I was born in 1914, November, so I actually was not quite seven years of age. Where'd you go to high school? I went to Miami High School. And after high school, where did you go? Well, I went to the University of Miami for one year. I had a scholarship. The money ran out, and that next year I went to the University of Florida. And there, there I graduated from Florida in 1936 with a law degree. Stop. Okay. After graduation from the University of Florida in 1936, I went to Stewart, Florida to practice law with a gentleman named T.T. T. Alderson. Mr. Alderson had gone to the University of uh, Florida Dean, or Dean of the Law School, and according to the dean's secretary, he had asked for some suggested names of lawyers that might be interested in practicing in Stewart. And when I went there for graduation, uh, the secretary of the dean said, the dean wants to see you. And I went to see him, and he told me about T.T. Alderson in Stewart, Florida. He said, stop by and see him on the way home, which I did. And he ultimately offered me an opportunity for, to work with him at $50 a month, which was the best offer I had at the time. And uh, a lawyer I knew in Miami, I, whom I admired very much, said, go there, but don't stay there in five years. You'll get a broad general experience quickly in a small town. And that I did. And I returned to Miami in January of, of 1941, I guess it was, which was a little less than five years. And I became a partner in in uh, Casey Walton in Spain. A classmate and friend of mine, Bill Lantaff, was a partner in that firm, and he was going on active duty with an actual guard. And he recommended me to become a member of the firm, which I did. And it was a great experience. Of course, living in Stewart, Florida was also a great experience for those four and a half years. I handled matters that I never handled again later because they were the kind that you just don't run into in many, many other situations. How, then I practiced law in, in Miami with Casey Walton in Spain, that later became Walton Lantaff, Schroeder, Atkins, Carson, and Wall. And on August 15, 1966, I was sworn in as a U.S. District Court judge, and I've been serving that capacity ever since. What made you want to become a lawyer? Well, I've often thought about that, and I believe it was the study of history in high school, and then at the University of Miami, I took a course in political science under a gentleman named Sidney Hale, and it inspired me to, to have a great interest in the law, and uh, I felt that probably the best way to carry out that knowledge and everything was to be a lawyer. So I, I continued my interest in 
in studying law. And when I went to the University of Florida after one year of academic completion, I was admitted to the law school. In those days, you had to have two years of pre-law, which I did. And uh, I think also that uh, engaging in the debate team at the University of Florida had something to do with my uh, interest in the law because it, it gave you the opportunity to argue a cause under given rules and regulations and uh, achieve a goal in that respect. And I felt the law was one means of of uh, recognizing the, the rights of people and presenting those rights in an orderly fashion. You could contend without being contentious. That's a great line. Thank uh, you. Now, Judge, when you took the bench in 1966... It was, yes. Actually, uh, I was sworn in on Assumption Day, August 15th, no relationship, of course. Um, that was an interesting time in the country, 1966. Um, what types of cases in those early years were you presiding over? Well, I did have, a, of course, you understand the district court generally is a court of, of a pretty much general jurisdiction so far as the federal jurisdiction is concerned. And I had uh, a number of criminal cases and I did have the school cases, you remember. Yes. And that was one that took quite a bit of my time, and on which I'm proud to have been a part of. In fact, I still have jurisdiction in the sense I have a by tri committee that advises the court on any changes in the courts in the school system. And uh, so I still have some kind of jurisdiction with respect to the school system. Judge, I want to go back uh, before you became a United States District Court judge. Yes. What was the practice of law like in the um, 40s, 50s, uh, early 60s? What was it like in Stewart and Miami? Well, I think there was a little less emphasis on uh, uh, the time record rec aspect in those days. Uh, it is a great profession because you have the opportunity to represent people that have certain rights that need to be ex ex uh, presented and ruled upon by a court or by the jury. And uh, I, I think in those earlier days, the, the lawyers probably were a little bit uh, less aggressive in terms of, of time recording. They've since become very possessed with that idea. Mm -hmm. And it is helpful to, have, to keep time records so you know what, where your time is going to and what work you've done, but to overemphasize it, uh, I think, uh, deviates from the concept that we, it is a profession and not a business, and that's the thing that the lawyers must keep in mind. You, you mentioned being a profession and, and not a business. Um, let me ask you these two questions first, and then we'll get to the yeah, profession well, yeah, water. And, and then the, the ethical issues. During your career, were there, do you have a certain philosophy of life that you have followed that have helped you maintain your balance through all these years? Well, as you know, I'm a Roman Catholic, and I've tried to adhere to the principles of my church as closely as I could. And... Uh, I try to be active in, in, in my church circles, my church organizations, and I felt that I had a duty to, to be, do the right thing to the best of my ability. And that's the thing that guided me through the years. That has been your core belief of just trying to do the right thing to the best of your ability? That's right. That, that's been my concept. And um, have you seen a, a change in the practice of law over the years that you have either been a lawyer or as a judge, the way lawyers are acting? Have you seen a change? I think there's been a little change. I think that sometimes the lawyers forget that it is a profession and not a business. Uh, we've got to recognize that its purpose is to uh, present in an orderly fashion and under the rules and regulations the rights of people that are involved and let the courts resolve those rights. And that's the thing the lawyers must keep in mind.
Can you tell me what your definition is of professionalism? What that means, to, what that word professionalism means to you? Well, it means to me that uh, there's a standard that you must adhere to in all circumstances. And you must not let your, your desire to win overcome that concept of professionalism, which is the conduct of a lawyer that meets all the standards of the, of the canons that are part of the ethics that we must adhere to. Do you believe that there's a difference between ethics and professionalism, that, uh, that uh, uh, professionalism is a higher standard than even uh, the canons of ethics? Well, I think it probably is, although the ethics are a part of it and must be adhered to fully. But professionalism is a concept that is not a business, but, but a, 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 an opportunity to represent people and present their rights in an orderly fashion. During your time as a uh, lawyer, um, do you believe that the number of lawyers uh, that were practicing law at that time versus today has made a difference in the way uh, lawyering is done? I think it made some, some difference. There's a little more aggressiveness now, I think, than there was then. But uh, and perhaps even the keeping of time record has had something to do with that. But basically, the lawyers are well trained, mm -hmm. and I think as long as they realize that it is a profession, it's just going to have the right results. As far as law schools are concerned, uh, have you had any thoughts as far as um, the training in law schools? Should there be more emphasis on uh, professionalism, ethics, as opposed to certain courses? Um, what are your thoughts about law well, schools? Well, I think they should include in the courses. Can you start again? You need to wait till he stops talking before you start. But go ahead now. Okay. I think they should include in all courses in law schools a course on ethics. And there should be an emphasis by the professors in the law schools on the standards of the canons and adhering to those canons in the practice of law. And you believe that that should be included in, in almost all courses that are taught? I think it should be, yes. Excuse me, one, one second. Well, you need to wait about two more seconds before you ask the next I'm sorry. Because you're right on the tail. Okay, I apologize. Sorry. As far as the law schools are concerned, it's your opinion that the um, in each course that is taught in law school, um, there should be some area of ethics and professionalism in each class as opposed to being separate from each course? Well, I think you should have both. I think that in the, in the regular courses, they should emphasize the, the professional quality and the canons, and there should be a separate course on that very subject as well. What type of cases did you work on at Walton Lantaff? It was primarily civil cases. Uh, we did represent some insurance companies and we would represent or defend the insureds under those policies of insurance. We had an occasional criminal case, but they were usually uh, commercial criminal cases generally. Did you, let me ask it this way, when did it come that you decided you wanted to be a judge? <clears throat> I think that serving as president of the... Hold on, let's judge. Judge, do you mind if I move this piece of paper? Because I'm hearing it on your microphone when you move it. All right, good. Just good. these two sheets right here. Good, right. If you want to fiddle with that, I won't hear okay. it. But the papers I can hear. All right. Thank you. I believe that serving as president of the Florida Bar, which was an integrated bar at that time, prior to that it was the old Florida Bar Association, I believe uh, president of the Florida Bar enhanced my interest in the uh, in becoming a federal district court judge because we were called upon to uh, evaluate proposals for appointment 
to the district bench, and uh, it, 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 I realized then that uh, there were certain standards that should be followed in, in uh, approving or, or uh, evaluating nominees for the for the courtship. And incidentally, in that respect, I felt there was that what was needed was a a person who was a, a good student of the law and who believed in its concept of of uh, affording rights to people that uh, may have rights under the law or under any uh, agreements or, or uh, bases that would afford those rights. Well, I, that takes me to my next question, Judge, and that is, what is your opinion as to what makes a good judge? What are the qualities of a good judge? Well, I think you need judicial temperament, for one thing. And I think the more experience he's had, particularly in, in the courtroom, the better he would be a district court judge, which is a trial court. As you know, the uh, appellate circuit court is, is an appellate court. Uh, it, it, you don't try cases there. You simply argue appeals or decide appeals that are argued uh, from district court decisions. But I do think judicial temperament is important. I think experience in, in the trial of cases is good. And of course, uh, a full concept that uh, that uh, the district, the bench, the court itself is simply to be sure that, that the rights of people are adequately protected and that the right kind of a decision is made on the basis of the laws before you. I want to go back to um, the cases that you were handling in the uh, in the 60s when you were a United States District Court judge and the school the school cases. Yeah. Can can you ex explain those a little bit more to us? What were they all about? Well, they involved the concept of there there being an integrated school system. As you know, prior to the Brown decision. Many schools, in, many districts in the South, many school districts, had separate schools, some for blacks and some for, for the whites. And uh, Brown versus School Board said there should be an integrated school system to the extent that it was possible to do so. And that was one of the things that was sought to be achieved by the school cases. And th there were a, there were a series of cases that that fell in front of you. Well, of course, the Dade County School case came before me, and that was the first one I had. Uh, then there were I had two others, which in which uh, there was a determination that they were that the system was unitary. That is, they did not discriminate between races in terms of school assignment. And uh, I no longer have those cases. Uh, I think there may be one of them that still I have a peripheral contact with, but but uh, the, the case in Bureau of Beach, as I remember, was concluded early, and I've no longer had any, any jurisdiction in that case. If you were to be given a magic wand, if I were to give you a magic wand and say to you that you could change anything in the law today to, in any capacity, what would you do, Judge? What, what would you like to see changed and why? Well, I'd like to see an understanding on the part of all the lawyers and the people that the judicial system is, is there to assure people of a receiving the rights they're entitled to have under the law and have it with the, the, the best kind of decorum and uh, uh, unity and, and smoothness that it would be possible. And if I were to ask you um, what message you would want to uh, give to lawyers just starting out in the profession, what, what kind of message would you like to give to them, Judge? Well, that we have a wonderful system of separation of powers and that uh, 
no other country in the world has achieved the goals that we have because of that, that concept of separation of powers. No one branch of government is in supreme. They all are subject to the constitutional limitations that have been adopted through the years and which were the concept on which our country was founded. Do you think that there should be a mentoring program for young lawyers where they could go and be trained by older lawyers after law school? Well, the idea is a good one. I think in earlier days there was more of that than there is now. Uh, I, I understand that before they had as many law schools, that a lawyer, that one who wanted to be a lawyer had to work with an already uh, licensed lawyer for a period of years before he was eligible or she was eligible to become a practicing lawyer. So that mentoring program would be a good one, I think. When you were president of the Florida Bar, what year was that, Judge? Do you recall? What did I what? When you were president of the Florida Bar? Yes. That was what year, Judge? Well, as, as I recall now, it was 1960, 61, I believe. Okay. Uh, what were the issues facing the Florida Bar at that time? Do you recall what you were focusing on or working on or wanting to accomplish as president? Well, it had been a, 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 an association previous to that time where you had to, if you joined, you did so voluntarily, but with a, the, the Florida Bar became an integrated bar, and the lawyers had to understand that uh, the integrated bar had disciplinary authority, and uh, that every lawyer had to, was a member of it automatically by the fact of being admitted to practice. And that was the thing that we sought to emphasize and do so in, in, a, in a proper, dignified way. I want to go back um, to the issue of ethics and professionalism again. Uh, there has been a lot of talk today about professionalism, Judge, and that the lack of professionalism, both um, in the bench and the bar. Um, do you have any thoughts as to whether or not you agree with that, that there is some professionalism problems? Uh, have you seen professionalism problems uh, from your vantage point? I have seen some, yes. A a uh, what have you seen? Well, it's a fair to understand that the law is a profession and not a business, and that uh, the standards of conduct, the canons, are supreme, and they should be adhered to regardless of, uh, of, the, of the goal that the lawyer may have in mind. In other words, the desire to win is proper, but you must win in a proper way. And it must be done in a professional manner, and that's why we must emphasize again that it is a profession and not a business. And have you um, seen uh, some some of the people I've interviewed have indicated that, for lack of a better term, greed has resulted in some unprofessional <laughs> conduct. Um, have you seen that at all? In, in I've seen some of it. Uh, again, it's because of their failure to realize that it is a profession and not a business. And that while it's, it's, it's appropriate to want to try to win if you can, uh, you've got to do so in a proper way. As I've said before, you can contend without being contentious. And let me just ask you a few other um, semi-personal questions. Okay. Uh, how long have you been married? Uh, you, you were married when? Married here in Miami, 1937. At Jeju Church. And, um, well, that's wonderful. Um, Judge, um, is there anything that you would like to say uh, to law students, lawyers, or judges that you think it's important that they should hear concerning the profession, concerning... Um, your beliefs about the profession? Well, I would want to emphasize again that we must always keep in mind 
that it, uh, we have a wonderful opportunity to represent the rights of people, but to do so in a proper manner. And present your positions without uh, uh, such zeal that you for, forego the standards of conduct that should govern you as a lawyer. Well put, well said. Judge, I want to thank you very much You're sure welcome. for the time you've given us, and I wish you good health and good fortune. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be included among the ten. <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, we, we sat down and we, uh, a committee got together, and the committee said, who are the people that it's so important that the young lawyers hear from who are the leaders in our profession. Uh -huh. And your name is always at the top of the list well, of the leaders of the profession. Thank you. They're probably doing it alphabetically again. <laughs> <laughs> Not so, Judge, but that's you know, very kind of you. It reminds me of a, a judge who said to the lawyers, please present your arguments chronologically. If you can't do it chronologically, at least do it alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> judge, thank you very much You're for sure your welcome. time. Thank, thank you so you. much for your... Consider me among the group you'd like to inquire of. Thank you, sir.